explains it for me. The goat, he screams like a man. I am so tired. I am so tired all the time. <laughs> but if you look up other goat screaming videos, they're amazing. We should just do this the rest of the hour today. So they have a system of a down music video where they insert goats into it. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> okay. It probably is required of me now to look for it. <laughs> I would think system of a down goat would probably be enough to do that. Chop suey. Wow. My friends are going to see that on Facebook today. <laughs> Oh, a compilation, because yeah. they did two of them. Wow, that's amazing. The other thing I found, I don't know if you notice on YouTube, there are like 10-hour videos that people do of things. Yeah. The, one, the first one I saw was 10-hour He-Man singing What's Going On. Two ads. <laughs> this goes on for ten hours. Let's go. Let's go to about hour five. Now, me and my family, me and my two kids had a challenge when they were, I don't know, I think my daughter, my one daughter was like a sophomore, the other daughter was a senior or a freshman and senior, to watch the Trollolo song for 10 hours. So we watched, we actually watched this video. And the rules were that you had to stay downstairs, so you couldn't go upstairs to escape it. So you had to go within earshot, and you could go to the bathroom, and you could make something to eat and all that. But otherwise, we stayed in the house, and we watched this for 10 hours, or listened to it. <laughs> 10 hours. The end was sort of anticlimactic, you know. My husband put Kenny G saxophone solo on 10 hour loop and hid his phone in the house and they couldn't find it. Oh my god. <laughs> That's horrible. Yeah, it was awful. Yeah. Uh, I just discovered this yesterday because I was, one of my friends said that they would have gotten out of here so fast it would have sounded like the, the 
cartoon running sound effect. And sure enough, there is a 10 hours of cartoon running sound effects. Yeah. That's my favorite one, I think. last time we were trying to get images to upload to our website and stored in the database and I got through two-thirds of it and I listed the things I needed to do and then I said well okay the last thing I need to do is to actually upload it and put it in the database. So I had some trouble with that. And I wanted to demonstrate the, the notion of doing things just a piece at a time. All right? Not trying to do everything at once, but get a piece of code working that does one thing. And that's it. Get it working, they go on to the next thing. They go on to the next thing. And typically I do it from, I start with the thing I'm most familiar with, then the thing I'm a little less familiar with, and then the last thing is the thing that I'm really not sure about. So I've, I've taken, I've done all the things that, yeah, I'm pretty solid with, and then I work on the thing that I'm less clear about. So what I'd like to do is show you the results of that and talk a little bit about my process in getting to this. Because I'd never done this before, and I kind of had done this in other applications, but I didn't know how you did it in ASP.NET.Core, so it's like, okay, let's see what we do. So, let me go and whoops. let's go and open this up. going to generate the database. Maybe. And I have an image, or actually I have two images, the one that we had last time, and also of Abe Vigoda. And I don't know, you young folks as they say, if you remember Abe Vigoda, but he was on the TV show Barney Miller, which was probably on 15 years before you were born. But he was also in the movie The Godfather. Uh, and the funny thing about Abe Vigoda is... He looked like an old guy even when he wasn't an old guy, all right? And the other funny thing about Abe Vigoda is that there was a long rumor that he was dead long before he actually died. He actually died only a couple years ago, but there was a reunion for the TV show Barney Miller, and some magazine said something like, well, Abe Vigoda wasn't with us for the Barney Miller reunion, and people took that as a euphemism that he was dead. So, you know, there is actually a website out there that had, is Abe Vigoda dead? And it displayed a status whether he was dead or not. 
And it was a sad day when that actually flipped to yes. So is Abe Vigoda still alive? And you go to is a Vigoda dead website, and it just says yes. February 24th to January 26th. All right, anyhow. So let's run this and show how it works. So, oh, forgot to update the database. Too busy talking about more important stuff like a Vagoda. go in and update the database. Now I'm going to go run this. Go into instructors, go into edit, shows the instructor there. I have the browse button to look for an image. put them on the desktop, right? Yeah. So I click browse. <coughs> I pick the image. I probably should change that, by the way. It says, it says all files. We'll look to see if that's something that we can, we can change. But I pick open. Then I click save. And now when I go back in, I only change the edit page, but the image is there and the database knows that the image is there. And if I hit save again, it doesn't screw it up. Okay, so that's what I accomplished with this. Let's look at the code that does that. All right. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the razor page itself because not much was done in the razor page. Just uh, a few things were done. But the first thing involved changing or adding an attribute to the form tag. All right. That says that this there's actually multi-part form data. In other words, we're sending text and an image up there. So uh, we have to add that to the form tag. I have a tag, input type equals file. Now, that is going to be platform specific. On the Mac, that's going to open up a Mac file dialog on a Windows machine that's going to open up a Windows file dialog. But it's like an input, except it allows you to choose a file. All right? Underneath that, or yeah, underneath that, I'm displaying the name of the image that's there. Then I have a little snippet of code that says, if that image is not empty, 
In other words, if there's something in the image name. So if the model is not null, in other words, for some reason, maybe we didn't retrieve an instructor or some unlikely circumstance and the model is null. So if there's something in the model and there's something in the image name, then I'm going to display the image. All right? And we display the image this way. This is a neat way where we can include some HTML smack dab in the middle of our C sharp code without exiting C sharp code. So here's our HTML. And smack dab in the middle of the HTML, I insert again some C sharp code to pull the value of the instructor image name and the full name for the alt attribute. So when I run this, not only am I setting the actual image, I'm setting the alt name of it as well. Notice, is my, notice the path I have. I'm going to upload things into the web server's root in a folder called images. So slash means the web server's root. Images is the folder for images. And then a slash is the slash indicating um, that... Uh, the, the directory name. And then there's the image name. So when I run this, again, look at the HTML if you're debugging this. Let me show you something. Let me show you a mistake I made. I forgot the, the slash the first time. Okay? So it said images and so on. So it's not going to work now when I display it. And this is something actually that running debugger probably wouldn't really help you with. Because the problem is, is in the HTML that got generated. So that doesn't work. If, however, I view the HTML, view the source, and scroll down and look, I can actually find that image tag, and I can maybe think of what, what, what went wrong. So the image tag has images slash hello PNG. When you don't start with a slash, where is it looking for that images folder? In the same folder that you're in. And in our case, that would be the pages folder is a good guess, but on the web server, it's looking for it in the instructors folder, which doesn't exist. All right? So there is no images underneath there. All right? So, therefore, we want to start at the web server root. How do you designate to start the web server root? That's when you start the URL with a slash. So if I change that back to include the slash, then it'll show up correctly. Someone asked me several years back by now to write a chapter in their book about C Sharp and ASP.NET. I was like, cool, I've never done that before. And they wanted it about the web stuff. So it was a general book about ASP, uh, or, or the .NET framework and C Sharp and all that. And they wanted to... Uh, they want a chapter about the web stuff, about ASP.NET. And I spent a lot of time talking about the HTML that got generated. And the person that was editing this book didn't like that. He was like, well, the people that are reading this book might not know HTML. You know, they might just be a, a C-sharp programmer and might not have familiarity with HTML. And my point was kind of, you can't really understand what ASP.NET does unless you do understand HTML. Because so much about debugging and figuring out what's going on is in looking at the HTML that got generated 
and knowing what it should be and seeing what's different about it. All right? And this was true then, at least as much as it is now, maybe even more. So they ended up not using my chapter for the book. But I got paid anyhow, so it didn't matter. All right? Because I did the work. They just decided not to use it. So never did find out what happened after that. I'm sure their book was horrible. All right. So, lesson number one in this, view the HTML if things don't turn out the way that you expected them to. All right? So, that's about all I did in the Razor page itself. So, to summarize, I put this on the form tag. I have a file input. And then I have this to make sure if there's some image there in the, in the model, then display the image tag. What I was getting without this is if someone didn't have an image, I'd get a broken image tag. So I put that in there to check to make sure that, hey, don't display an image if there isn't an image. All right, most of the fun happened in the model, though. And specifically, most of it happened on on post async. Okay? So, we were passing the ID in, because remember the ID is what we need to update. It's the row in the table that we're updating. I changed this to pass in a file, an iForm file, and I call it file, all right? Now, it's not a coincidence that this matches this. I chose the name file because that's what it's called in the form. If you didn't do that, then it wouldn't work. You wouldn't get past the file. All right? So what do you get when you do this? You get a pointer to a file object. All right? And we could do stuff with that object. What I want to do is I want to pluck out of that object the file name. Okay? So I want to pluck out of that object the file name. Because what we're going to get is we're going to get a path. So let's say I was on my computer and I was uploading a file from C slash uh, user slash mzellers slash desktop and I was uploading a, a, a file named me.jpg. All right? I want to pluck out the me.jpg part from that, okay? Because that's what I'm going to store in the database. I'm not going to store the full path in the database because that's someone else's computer. That's not the server's computer. And what's more, it could actually be a Mac that has a different sort of directory structure than Windows or a Linux machine, all right? So therefore, I want the file name because that's what I'm going to store in the database. If we go and look in the database for that person, if we do the view, and we look at that database, You'll notice that that's what we store. We store the name of the file, not the full path where it came from. Because the full path where it came from is useless to us. Okay? Because it's another machine. It's not our server. And what do we do with this? Well, remember, we take and we concatenate the images folder in front of it to give us the full path to the image. 
So we get images slash hello.png. So I want to extract from this the full file name, or just the file name. First thing I do is I look to see if the file was null. Because this scenario is to check for this. Let's say I go in and change that person, but I don't upload a new file. So I go in to instructors, I say I want to edit them, and I don't pick a new file. All right? If I do that, then my file control is null. Before I put that if statement in, it was working and it was uploading the file. But then if I didn't upload that file every time I went to edit the person, it got rid of the file from the database because this was null. And so it replaced what was in the file with null. So I have to put this check in. So if the file is null, then I don't do anything, don't do any of this. But if the file is not null, I look to make sure the file length is greater than zero. Well, you know, with an image it will be. I pluck out the file name part from the full file name. Remember, this file that gets passed in here is an object, an iForm file object. And it has a bunch of attributes. One of the attributes is the file name. But the file name is the full path. So I found that out by when I first ran this, I would get these really long file names because it included the path. So I knew that that was wrong. How did I tell that? How did I figure that out? Because you could read through pages and pages of documentation to figure that out, right? Or you could simply run this through debug. So I set a breakpoint here. And I ran it. So let's pick a different image this time. All right. If I put my mouth there, notice that the full path name is C colon slash slash user slash slash LCCC lab slash slash desktop slash slash a pagoda dot JPEG. Okay. So I want to pluck from that just the file name. And the file name, after I run that command, to say give me the file name from this full path, it gives me just the file name. It's a little confusing because file name is used two ways in this. In this attribute file name, the file name is the full path that includes all the directories and the file name. But in this function get file name, that strips off the path and just returns the last part of the path, the file name. So that's a little confusing. Running it through debugger shows you exactly what's going on if you're not sure. So when I had this situation where I was getting the full path and all I wanted was this, what I did was I went and Googled uh, what I say, ASP dot dot core C sharp get file name from path. And
it tells us this. Use the getFileName method of the path class. So they show us an example here. And that's exactly what I want. All right. So now I have to decide where to put it. All right. So where and where do I want to put this? I want to put this in my web server's root folder in the images folder. So that's where I want to put the file. And you notice that's where that file ended up. It wasn't there originally. I don't know if I showed you or not, but it was only there when I uploaded it. So how do you know where to put it? Well, I have the file path of the input file that I want. All right. That's file. File contains the full file name that I want. I have to put it in the web server's root plus the images folder. So the question is, where is the web server's root? And that's where I found out that there is a environment variable that contains the web server's root. So how did I go and do this? I googled ASP.NET Core find get web root path. And it will show me how to do that. Now the problem is I need an environment variable. All right. And previously there was no environment variable in this because it didn't need it. So I actually created an environment variable. And I put on the constructor that I needed the environment variable. Now here's the interesting thing. And I, I don't, I have to confess, I don't 100% understand this. But it seems like with this .NET core framework, if you put, if you want something to appear in a function, if you put it there, it's magically there. I think that's called dependency injection. Whereas I need an environment variable there, so I put that as part of the constructor of this, and then the framework guarantees that that environment variable is available, provided it's something that is available in the, in the framework and, and all that. So I put that in the edit model constructor, and then automatically I have that environment variable. So. Here's what I have. I have the file, which is an object that points to the file on the client's machine. I have the file name, which is just the file name part of it, stripping off all the directories. That's what I'm going to store in the database. I have file path, with this is where I want to put it on my server. And then I use this command to create, create a stream Stream is like a pipeline, all right, that's going to stream and create a file, and it's going to put it to that path. And then I say, I want to stream that file. I want to copy that file to that stream. And the result of that is it will take the file on the client system and stream it to this stream which ends up putting it in my web server's images folder. That's only half the job, though. All right? That's only half the job. That is getting the file uploaded to the web server. All right? The last half of 
the job is updating the database with the file name. Now, we have the file name in here. The file name is one of two things. It's either the name of the file that we just uploaded, if they selected a file, or it's an empty string if they didn't uh, uh, upload a file. So if they don't want to change the file, that file is going to be an empty string. All right. So. Here's our update statement. This is using link, again, where we put our, we don't write native SQL statements. We use this language to manipulate in C Sharp, which has its advantages. Namely, it's smart enough to know at compile time what's there and what isn't. Whereas if you write SQL statements, you just write a giant string and you can put anything in that string that you want. So, here is going to update the image name. All right. Now, the image name isn't on the form. All right, so it's not going to update it. However, down here, I check to see if that file name length is greater than zero. So in other words, did they choose a file name? If they did, then I set instructor to update, I set their image name equal to file name. All right. And then I do the update. When I read, when I, when I looked uh, for this documentation, I looked for, I Googled, something like put this function here because I figured that would be useful. I want to update a field manually. programmatically changing values before. And I think this is what I found. Yeah. And it says, if you want to change additional properties that don't exist in the form, you can do so anywhere but before this command. So I went in here and put that in before that command. And I'm good to go. All right. And that's about it. This is a little harder than I thought. But breaking it down piece by piece, running it through the debugger, looking at the HTML that was generated, strategic Googling of a few things, really pointed me in the right direction. I have students tell me sometimes they don't know what to Google. And I can appreciate that. All right. Uh, it is a skill, all right? Um, and that's one of the reasons why I talked about some of the things that I Googled here. The thought is, is that you'll hear those, and you see the process I went through in debugging it, and that'll help you formulate your questions to Google if you run into difficulty. Now, this example is meant to be more than just how to upload images and up update the database. All right. For example, if you had a date updated field in a table and you wanted to set that, well, you would set that right here. All right. This is also sort of a bigger picture thing because I wanted to show you how any big task you can break down into littler tasks and approach systematically and get to where you want. There's a lot of stuff in .NET Core. There's a lot of classes with properties and methods and all that stuff. It's impossible to know all of it. 
But if you have good troubleshooting skills and good research skills, you should be able to take and figure out what you need to do to do something. And frankly, in this class, that's partly what I'm here for. All right? Because I recognize some of this stuff ain't easy to figure out. Because just because the answer is there doesn't mean that the answer is apparent. All right? So I wanted to go through and sort of help you out with the problem areas that you're having as far as your project goes. The basic functionality of, of creating your database, updating your database, scaffolding, modifying your database, adding fields, and even related tables, I think we've done enough practice on that where we kind of have that down. And that should be a good portion of your project. All right? But my guess is that most of you have a few things maybe that we haven't discussed in class. So really that's what I sort of plan on doing is helping you out with that sort of thing. Does anyone have any other project related questions? Let's see what time it is. 11 o'clock. We have a little bit of time. So what I'm going to do, what I want to look at is more link examples. And I posted to Canvas a tutorial, which you should be able to run. And did I close? Yeah, I closed out of that project. I don't think I wanted to do that. I'll open it back up. So we're going to look at some of these examples here. And I'm actually going to create pages that do these and, and output them. So here is an overview of Lake. stands for language integrated queries. Allows writing queries even without the knowledge of query languages like XML, SQL, and so on. So in other words, there's different ways to get data depending on where it's stored. If it's stored in a database, it's stored as tables and you do your queries as a select statement. All right. If it's stored as an XML file, you do you you parse the XML file and you query it using a whole separate set of functions, and you don't use a select statement. What Link does is it sort of gives you a way of being able to pull the same data the same way regardless of where it's physically stored. And that's a really good thing to be able to do that. So, here are two different syntaxes that you can use. You could say, give me all the words that are stored somewhere. In our case, this would be a model. So this would be a model that 
relates to a database. And the where clause is, give me words where words length is greater than 10. Now there's a slightly different syntax for doing that. You could also do the same thing this way. From W in words where W length is greater than 10. So these two are approximately the same thing. Most of the examples I see use these lambda expressions. And again, type of link mentioned are linked to objects, linked to XML, to data sets, to SQL, and to entities. So all these languages can go through the link to go through to get to the data. It's an additional layer. All right, let's look at some of the examples. This is actually doing queries on lists. A list of objects. So again, it doesn't have to be a relational database. So, this is giving me a list of students whose age is greater than 18 and whose standard, whatever that is, is greater than zero. And then we can select that. So we can go and run this, and again, student list in this case is simply a list of student objects. But it doesn't have to be. It could be an entity in the database. All right. In this example, they are not using entities in a database, probably because it makes the example simple for them. They don't have to worry about a database connection and all that. All right, but in our case, student list would refer probably to one of the entities in our database. So, this is going to go and it's going to loop through and it's going to give students whose standard is greater than zero and whose age is greater than 18. So, that would be this student, Steve, and Ram. What if we change it to greater than or equal to 18 and run it? Then we get John, Steve, Bill, and Ram. What if we take this out? Then we get all four of those. So it doesn't worry about the value of the standard. This gives a list of all the teenage students by giving a list where the age is between 12 and 20. We change this though, change someone's age or whatever, and run it, then they're included. This shows us how to do a group by. All right? Remember, group by is an aggregate function. So, if I want to see the students grouped by 
their age, I could run this. And what it does is it shows me the first standard. Actually, this isn't age. This is by standard. Group by standard ID. This shows me that in the first group, standard zero is Ron. In the second group, standard one is John and Steve. In the third group, standard two is Bill and Ram. And again, if you want to do the same thing, but not include people that don't have a standard, you simply include a where clause on here. Doing this is a lot like writing SQL, but it's not SQL. It's in its own language. Left outer join. That would show me I'm going to join students with standards. So since it's an outer join, it is going to show me standards. It's not going to show me students that don't have standards, but it would show me a standard that doesn't have a student. So for example, standard 3 doesn't have any students, but it shows me on that list. And that's because we're doing a join on that. That's an output that only shows the student name and the standard name. This is sorting. An inner join. So that would only show if someone had a standard. So this doesn't show standards that don't have students or students that don't have standards. A nested query, which we talked about, and so on. There's also ways to do aggregate functions to get a count of things as well. All right. My suggestion is to go through this tutorial and then start the lab assignment, which is to add a bunch of queries to you know, create a handful of queries from the database that you were using and display those on each on each. I think I said each on their own page. as I keep old versions of stuff around. So lab 12, <coughs> add a state column to customer, add a table for order, then create a web page for each of the following queries. So give me a list of customers and their total order quantity. All right. Show state and number of customers per state. Show only customers that have an assigned sales rep. Show all customers regardless if they have a sales, a sales rep or not. Now, we have three more classes, three more classroom sessions, believe it or not. All right? Uh, once we hit October, it's like time is like, those calendars in old-fashioned movies, like the days just drop by, they go by so fast. So I'm amazed how quickly we're near the end of the semester. What I plan to do is this. We'll meet in here at the beginning of class, so at 10.15. We'll meet in here. I'll touch base to see if you have questions about the project or questions about any labs or anything like that. If you do, we'll spend some time talking about them. If you don't, then we'll just go to lab because you have a lot of stuff to do and I really want you to do a good job on the project. 
So I want to make sure that there's adequate time. So we'll do that for each of the last three class sessions. We'll come in here, we'll touch base, I'll answer questions that you're having, and then we'll go to lab. All right? Any questions right now? All right. That's it. I'll go unlock lab. I'll come.